Hi guys, my name's Elizabeth Carner. I am a producer at Cargo, and then I also art direct and set design when needed. Um, I started that probably about two years ago, stepping into that role, and it's just becoming more and more <laughs> common as budget sometimes gets smaller, but it's been really fun to learn and grow in. Hello everyone, my name is Jaden Gutierrez and I am a special effects makeup artist, also hair. I specialize in prosthetic work and uh, fabrication, props, editorial beauty, face and body painting, and cosmetic correction. Um, I also have been an instructor for color theory at Greenville Technical College um, for the esthetician program and also licensed esthetician as well. And I've been in the industry for about two and a half years now. Um, I'm just passing down my mom's work because she was a makeup artist for Paramount um, Studios in Los Angeles is where I'm from. My name is Heather Davidson. Um, I'm from Greenville. I do set design and I dabble in just about anything you let me tag along and learn something on set. <laughs> um, I started just before COVID, um, I actually walked on a set as an extra and was like, you guys need some help. Let me help you the next time <laughs> around. And uh, yeah, that's how I got into, how I got my foot in the door anyway. Um, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> cool. So yeah, first question is just, what are some of the roles or um, job titles, whatever you can find in the art department? Anybody can answer that, maybe we've got. So, I think there's some roles. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, let me put on my producer hat. So roles you usually see in art department are the art director. So they're kind of over the whole vision. And then you, depending on the size of your budget, you might see a set designer at, underneath that, a props master or a props person. Ideally, if you have food involved, you have someone who's a food designer. Um, there isn't a lot of that here in Greenville, so if you're looking for a niche, get really good at making food beautiful, because right now you really gotta go to Asheville or Charlotte or Atlanta to find someone. Um, wardrobe is, you know, that's your costuming, and then I don't know if you wanna speak to hair and makeup. Yeah. And, and two, depending on the size, like if you're on a huge budget, you have, you know, art PAs, you have, you know, a lead, which they're over a group of people, or getting just furniture in and out. So it, it's like with anything, it can grow into a lot more positions if you have a bigger budget. But typically around here, you're gonna see an art director slash set designer, and then art PAs. Um, yes, there is a lot of roles for, it's like the art department and then there's a niche and then there's even more baby niches under that one niche. Um, as far as regarding hair and makeup, there are a lot of roles um, that definitely you wouldn't think they needed a director for or an assistant for. I know that you can um, be a role as to input contact lenses in for certain characters post makeup and you have to specialize um, in doing so. so a broad of specialization in prosthetic work. There is um, not only just applying, there's types of prosthetics uh, just for the face, but the full body pieces. You may have heard as um, fat suits or aging or even um, decaying or de uh, decomposition pieces as well. And then even under that, there's the puppeteering and engineering with um, prosthetics, which is sculpting, your molding. Um, so an example for that could be just the technology and engineering of maybe needing to chop a finger off. So there's that mixture of engineering. Um, other than just a hair and makeup roles, uh, definitely I would say we work a lot with more set design and wardrobe. So when we put together the costumes and the accessories, making sure that things will um, coexist with each other and you know things of whatnot. I think you guys about covered it. <laughs> yeah. Do the uh, next question. What are some of the tools that you guys will find in our 
our department. So uh, I recently went to you in our department and I brought some tools and my PA kit, but also, I mean, you're gonna have different tools in your uh, makeup set or if you need a steamer or a costume, what are some common tools you guys would see? In I keep a tote with me that's got scissors and any kind of tape you can think of, hooks, um, like a sheet, drapery, like a lot of random things that you wouldn't expect to see on set, fishing line, um, like blackout curtains, things like that, just in case, you know? I don't know if you wanna add mm -hmm. to that. Yeah. <laughs> um, as, other than, I guess, um, cosmetic equipment, you know, you expect like just the, the hairbrush, the standard, cosmetic um, like foundations and stuff, there's actually a lot more to it. I find myself caring as far as the theatrical side. I carried a lot of fake nails and like um, poly grip for if we do denture work. I find myself carrying um, fishing line as well to do line work that maybe finer brushes won't. Um, I do carry a lot of hair, uh, not just styling basics, but wig caps. Uh, if I need to help maybe assist wig blocking if I'm doing something more theater related. Um, I think I've had to bring lighter fluid before to lubricate a prosthetic that wasn't fully molded. So you run into little things like that where you, you'll need things that you honestly would say, why is that even being used with makeup? <laughs> yeah. Um Side story, I when one of my first productions, I was just like a producer and we didn't have hair and makeup. And I had a girl show up with all of her nails broken off and we were supposed to shoot close-ups of her hands. And thankfully, my boss had a fake nail kit in her purse. <laughs> and I, as a producer, I was gluing fake nails on her because you gotta do what you gotta do to get the shot done. Um, I think, yeah, kind of going off what Heather said, you always need more than you think. Um, recently on a shoot, like I knew exactly what we were shooting. I had the props, but then the director was suddenly like, I want to Greek something out that wasn't even originally in the shot. And thankfully the gaff team had um, some, f I'm probably not going to use the correct term, film tape or something to cover. Thank you, to cover up. Um, Cause I didn't, I didn't have that with me. Um, I had like my small sticker Greeking kit um, matte spray, I would not go without matte spray anywhere. Even if you think things aren't shiny, you're always, a random thing will be shiny and you have to spray it and you can always wipe matte spray off. Um, and I'm trying to think what else. It's really just having like a toolbox. Um, people think that set design is just picking out furniture and moving stuff around but really you're trying to make an environment come to life and a lot of it's needing light construction <laughs> tools. Um, so you have to have a drill, um, I would say putty to wipe up any holes and paint. Um, that's where it's so ideal if you can at least get eyes on the space. A lot of times art doesn't get to come in until a few hours before the shot happens and we have to move really fast but if we can get eyes on the space, we can plan beforehand. Um, and then always, like even if you're showing up for a small talking head shoot, I would still have some pillows with you, like throw pillows in case you need someone to sit up in a chair, um, and a couple of fake plants, because that can just really help add to the space. Yeah, um, for me, I'm blessed at Cargo where usually the DP is in the office with me. That's not always the case, but most of the time. So I talk to him a lot about every shot, so I have an understanding. Um, especially nowadays with LED screens becoming more of the future of film. Um, with those, you're not just having, you don't have the camera move for every shot. The art department is moving for every shot. So if this was the screen behind me, I have 
you know, cameras facing this way, fixed, and they're shooting, and then we have to do a 360 or a 180. So really understanding that and all the angles is highly important. And then once I'm on set, I'm really talking to the first AD and then collaborating sometimes with hair and makeup because, um, I mean wardrobe, not hair and makeup. People don't realize this, like a watch is considered a prop. Glasses are considered a prop. Anything that's hard and not a soft material is a prop. Um, so you, you collaborate with wardrobe beforehand, ideally, or you both bring options and you figure out how to make it work. 1,000% agree with everything Ms. Elizabeth just said, um, especially wardrobe, um, because usually when you have your cast coming in, they sit in your chair to get their hair and makeup done, they're probably wearing something they came in on set with and not the actual costume or haven't been changed out yet. So you, you, know, you kind of work with color. So color theory is extremely important. And you know, you might you want to premeditate knowing what is this character, how many changes, or even if it's just one um, outfit, they will stay in one day. That the color to that has to be extremely consistent. I find myself working with lighting as well. Lighting is um, immensely important. Direction of lighting, amount of lighting use. Um, that is what casts certain contours, shadows. Um, what brings color out, certain props they might use might uh, deflect or coexist with the colors that they have on, whether it's just regular cosmetic beauty or special effects and more. Also find, um, probably I find myself working with the actresses and actors as well, understanding their character and emotion and how that would fit with um, just the role that they may play playing or supporting. Um, I've had a situation where the story might have not been 100% set down. It was constantly changing. And basically, we went with something super colorful. It was really beautiful in the chair. But when they had put their costume on a wardrobe, it kind of shifted the mood that they needed to go for. And it just didn't really make sense. So that's usually a huge important as far as communication with all of those people. Um, you know, I used to think it was kind of like they're in my chair and I do what I need to do and then they, you know, I send them to where they need to be, but it goes far more than that. It hits several filters as far as communicating with everybody on set and the outcome of what the results may look like. I definitely agree with everything they said. Um, I start communication from the top. As soon as I get the script, um, I go through and I'm I read everything and try to imagine it in my head, and I write down everything that my brain comes up with in the margins. And I make a list, and I'm, any questions that I have about um, anything script-related, um, I'll go to the director or the DA or whoever that I'm in c communication with um, and make sure that I'm on the same page with them. Um, my vision is matching their vision, um, and I do that pretty much the whole time. So I do it with my first list and then I get my props together and I send pictures, is this okay? Is this, you know, yes or no? What do you like better? I uh, try to give options because I have not communicated because I was afraid to ask or, you know, thought that I knew what it, what was expected and then I get there on set and it was not how I thought and I was missing things and it just didn't go like I thought it was going to. So hindsight 2020, always ask as many questions as possible. Um, write down everything. I make so many lists. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, communication. Communicate with everybody. Um, if you're going to be in the same space with them, then you're going to need to know what's going on with them, whether you think that their job directly affects you or not. Well, and I, can I go off of that? I think that goes into kind of the process and where pre-pro is so important. Um, you know, ideally, you're, you're doing a mood board first so you can get the idea, like, is my vision, is what I read matching what the director wants? Um, I went through a situation where I met with the director, I asked them a bunch of questions, and it's like, all right, yeah, you want a modern look. Cool, cool, cool. And then I start sending them... I'd send them a lookbook, and the guy's like, 
no, I want mid-century modern. I'm like, oh, okay, let me pivot, start pivoting. Long short of it, he really wanted German brutalism or just like very different from what he first talked about. And so going through the process of like getting that mood board first done or making sure I have, if it's an ad, you have all the brand colors is very important. Um, and then from there, you start to actually build out like your set and prop a list and pictures for them to look at, to choose from, like you said. And then ideally, your wardrobe person is doing the same thing, so then hair and makeup can be like, bam, 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 and everything looks good, and the director is like, yeah, and the DP's like, yeah. Um, that doesn't always happen, obviously, because of time, but that's the ideal process, just so you're not running with your head cut off during set time, so yeah. If someone wants to get into art department, what would you say? I would say um, start off as an art PA. Just um, example, we had a girl who started working with us as a PA, and then we realized, oh, she kind of has a knack for art PA. So we kept assigning her to art PA. And then on our last shoot, she stepped in when I had to step away for two days um, off set and she ran art and props. And she just kept being there and kept being reliable and showing initiative. So that, that's my best advice. For any role, really. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would say if anyone would be interested to do hair and makeup, um, as far as cosmetic correction and color theory, I would start off with just the basics of knowing um, beauty, maybe the beauty industry separate first. Um, that may honestly be first working in retail, working at a consultant counter, working with just basics of skincare, beauty. Um, and then if you wanna move up, maybe that's when you kind of enter prom events, bridal events, just to introduce you into the atmosphere, um, not only artistically, but emotionally and physically. Um, so you know basically kind of the whole like niche of it. And then usually beauty will brand you enough to move forward to more on um, corporate things or anything on set or anything on film. I know recently I worked with a commercial, uh, which was, I'm used to always working with short films, but when I did commercial, I got the taste of the corporate side and not something just indie and, it, and, and you know, kind of less organic and more strict. But it was really um, kind of a breath of fresh air because I got to see that, you know, people on set are far different, just basing off if they need beauty or if they need something more realistic, prosthetic wise. So really just experience as well is what I really would say as far as devoting time to. It's just honestly trying over and over again for experience, um, especially if you want to go in the line of professionalism in the industry as well. You are, well, hold on, you mm -hmm. are certified as well. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, in the state of South Carolina, you do not need a certi certification or license for vocational school, so that would be for special effects. But you do need at least a cosmetology license or a beautician license. So I am a licensed esthetician, so that it gives me the credential to at least practice and service my craft in the state of South Carolina. But it is not a requirement, it just is really based on your area. Um, if you do not want to jump to being a beautician first, um, the only reason why I did skin and I studied skin was just um, that's very important. A clean application, great results in your canvas. Uh, but there are, are separate online courses or in school, which is more hands-on to do prosthetic work and then just basic special effects as well. Um, I would say just show up and be available. Um, you can't learn anything if you're not there. That's, what, that's how I've gotten any of the jobs that I've gotten. I show up and I open my mouth and ask questions. And you know, what can I do to help? Can I, can I carry this for you? And you know, just being there, you pick up more than you realize. So. Cool. Uh, does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask? Is there, a sec is there any books you would recommend, like a handbook or a Bible or a set design? If anything comes to mind later on, whatever. 
But you have one for, I have one for makeup. Um, as far as anything to study in literature wise, Thomas Savini, he's one of the golden monster makers from Los Angeles. Um, he is known as the man of thousand faces. And I would definitely recommend uh, that book because that's the most recent book I have been reading right now. Um, they have a lot more on Rick Baker, Dick Smith. Um, Tom Savini, though, is probably the best to introduce yourself into makeup as well. Um, but with, when you go to school, uh, you do learn and get certified in just the basic beauty. So the textbooks they give you, you'll definitely study that in the esthetician field as well. But there is definitely a lot, um, even other just books, digital reading, um, even just YouTube tutorials. It sounds very amateur, but you know, you, I kind of myself started off like Halloween is what some people view special effects. But and then I, you know, I realized like this, this is a whole career that is extremely thriving. And it's crazy how I can start off just watching maybe a classic Boris Karloff Frankenstein face paint for two minutes on YouTube. And then now I'm in the film industry doing it with prosthetics. Um, I would say the virtual producer, it's a book, it's a textbook, is a great resource to have. Um, it is more about the LED screen, but I really benefited from reading that and understanding just how that works. And um, so that's one. And then I'm going down to Charleston this weekend for a training, so I might have more for you in like a month. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I would say the vir the virtual producer is a good one. I have a question for you. Um, so you you have a script and you start breaking it down. How do you reconcile the sort of yin and yang between being the producer, the one with the checkbook, and being the production designer, the one who wants to make this look fabulous, but obviously that costs money. How do, you, how do you balance that? <laughs> yeah, um, that's probably a, a struggle for me with every shoot. Um, first, I, I try to go in and just kind of count everything out in the scenes and make sure I have a good understanding of that and start to visualize it. Um, and I don't, I'm, I don't always know the... Um, I'm not always playing producer. I don't always know the budget when I'm set designing. Like on this last shoot, I was, I did not know my budget until three weeks before. So I was already building everything out, um, my mood board and what I was thinking. But when I do know the budget, I guess I'm just thinking of crafty ways or I'm going back to the script writer and I'm saying like, we don't need 15 extras. <laughs> um, we don't. Can we condense this down into one scene? Um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not afraid to figure out how to collaborate and problem solve, whether that's with my writer, my director, my DP, because whatever we do shoot, I want it to look amazing, you know? And um, making sure it does come to life, but I think it's just a balancing act, because the, at the end of it, like, if I only have 4K for props and I have four scenes I'm going to have to do and build out, it's probably not going to look great because you always need more than what you think. And Heather can speak to this after me, but typically, even when I haven't art directed and I've hired someone, you buy more, you probably go a grand over your budget and then you end up returning stuff that you don't necessarily use because you want to have it that's stressful for me as a line producer. And a lot of times I rob Peter to pay Paul, um, take money from somewhere else. But it takes a lot to make something look realistic. And I think your brain, especially if you're doing commercials, you know, if I'm sure we all, I watch commercials a lot just because it's my job. And you can tell when something's really well art directed and it has all the colors of the brand. Like, for example, um, oh. I can't think of the brand right now. It's the green and um, purple dishwasher brand. Cascade, thank you. <laughs> Cascade, no one has a purple kitchen, but in a Cascade commercial, people have purple kitchens. They're in a green polo. 
and it looks fabulous. And like just that, you can tell there's an elevation there and you see that branding and it sticks with you. Um, Heather, I'm sure you have more. I mean, you pretty much nailed it, but it's a lot of crafting and seeing what you can create out of almost nothing sometimes. I work on a lot of low budget or no budget sets and it's whatever I've got in my garage that I can throw together to make this happen. Um, a lot of times on those sets, I end up spending money with a zero budget and that's, I look at that as, you know, that's an investment for me because I'll have that for the next time or I can't tell you how many things are in my garage that, you know, I bought for this one thing, I'm like, I'm not getting rid of that because I know I'm gonna need it again. Um, or I've used it in a totally different way than what I bought it for its intended purpose. Um, budget is really hard on set. Like I said, a lot of the stuff I've done is low budget or no budget and you really have to work to make it look real. Um, I don't really know what to add to that um, other than, you know, you just, Imagine it and make it happen. That's really what I do. <laughs> when I think not being afraid to ask, like, yeah. I've been on, we had a set where we had no budget and I had to, I don't know if they can hear you. Sorry. I'm sorry. I had to create a murder scene and I brought a lot of my own stuff and we went to the, um, the Goodwill where you pay by the pound. That's like a really good place to go and got a bunch of stuff. And then I asked everyone else on set, could you bring stuff? Um, yeah. So I think if you are working on a really low budget um, film, just to not be afraid to ask. Like yeah. we work in an industry that's uber collaborative and that's the thing I love about it. Yeah, I borrow items, strange items that I borrow all the time. Uh, kids cleats for the last thing that I did, you know, I'm not gonna go buy those. Um, but yeah, asking around uh, my family has pulled things out of their living rooms so that I can borrow it for a couple of weeks. And, you know, I've taken whole rooms of my grandma's, you know, to create a scene here. But, um, yeah, that's the best budget creating is, you know, borrowing because you can give it back. It didn't cost you a dime. <laughs> um, what are some... I have a question, but I also have a story in my head that I'm going to share. But anyway, the question is, what are some uh, funny stories or horror stories I'm sure I do, but uh, not off the top of my head. <laughs> um, I guess at the top, what comes to mind first is I've had to replicate um, fake saliva. So I've had to, my esthetician in my mind came through because when I do facials, um, I part of, part of uh, when I learned school is frothing the cleanser. So when I, it just instantly in my mind, I was like, oh, froth looks like spit. So I frothed up some double cleansing like concoction. And then I used like a popsicle stick to flick it because it was a scene where it was kind of like as soon as we rolled camera, it was an in action frame by frame thing. And that's that's something I've had, had to do, which was interesting because there is some people who are out there who are dedicated and it was like, you know what, just spit on me for real. But you know, we gotta keep in mind, well, before we do that, I can mock saliva. So, that's, <laughs> so that is one thing. Um, that you know comes to mind. I get another like I guess a horror story that I've had is um, I have had to put a, a full face of, of a foam latex piece on set, and I always make sure that if there is at least the leading star roles, that I get a good headshot of them, so I know as far as features um, what I will be not only working on but working with. And in the headshot, one of the actors did not have facial hair. And the big thing with um, full piece prosthetics is the adhesive. And I can work over hair, but the person was very particular about their beard. And they were like, well, no one told me to shave my beard. So it's just, it was kind of like in the rut of, okay, he either loses the beard or he loses being the main role and this piece has to go on someone else. So that's another, another thing you kind of run into. It's, it's pretty comical, but I feel bad because I still wonder if he got the role or he shaved his beard. <laughs> One? Not with set design. I have other horror stories. But. Yeah. Um, I think this goes back to every shoot I do, I learn something. And I think we're all that way. So it's just like being out there, being on set. Um, but it's not really a horror story. It's more of just 
always bring a full kit. We went up to shoot in an apartment where like we needed to have a really small footprint. So I just brought my props and that I knew I needed and that was it. And um, it ended up being wardrobe. They had like a title printed on the back of a jumpsuit and it was rubbing off. And so wardrobe came over to me and was like, do you have a Sharpie? Do you have paint or anything? And I didn't because I didn't bring um, my like full kit. And so it was just like one of those lessons learned, like always have white and black Sharpies on you, always have tape, um, just things like that. Always be prepared for the unexpected because it's gonna happen. Like what you think can't happen will happen. Um, so I think that, and then I'm trying to think, well, this, I wasn't there and Rhodes could maybe speak to this more, but once again, we were shooting food and I mentioned this earlier, there really aren't a lot of food people here in Greenville that do um, food propping or food design. And I had to have like 20 burgers ready that looked appetized and ready to eat. And Rhodes and I were collaborating beforehand and Rhodes was like, why don't we get pre-cooked burgers? And I was like, yes, genius. Um, but it turns out even after, and they had like the grill marks, but even afterwards they did not look great. So our art PA who has a van that she lives out of had her little like camping broiler like stove and she was cooking burgers out in the parking lot while we we're shooting. Um, and the final shot, they look amazing, but just talk about problem solving and yeah. And lesson learned, like you need a, if you're going to have food, I would dedicate a person to be in charge of food. That's my advice. Um, we were kind of splitting it as a team with our art PAs and I had planned everything, but I, to do it again, I'm going to have one person in charge of it. They know where everything is. And you can't fake uncooked burgers. I so. actually do have a story that I can add on with that. OK, perfect. I was actually doing a craft. So I'm at this particular uh, set, I was cooking on site. And there was a, the scene that they were filming was a cookout. And nobody thought to bring anything for that. I was just crafty, you know, I wasn't set design on this. So they come to me and they're like, we need burgers. I'm like, the burgers aren't ready. It's, you know, lunch isn't until, you know, however long. And so I ended up having to spit burgers out for them to have on their grill. <laughs> but it worked out. It was just, you know, now somebody's eating cold burgers because it's not time. <laughs> any kind of, um, well, I don't know the word I'm looking for, any feedback, really. Um, I know that I bug the crap out of whoever I'm working with because I ask so many questions. So um, if, but I mean, otherwise I'm not gonna know. So um, if you tell me up front exactly what you want, great. Otherwise, I'm just gonna keep asking. <laughs> I would definitely say as far as um, when when we even if I even get the inquiry or invoice of hey I need you on set for blank and I ask you know what are some production details you have in mind or if it's not in production what is your like creative vision behind it definitely reference and inspiration and past inspiration um, it helps a mixture of maybe them finding you know, already made movies, characters, or they can even kind of mix it up and say, well, I saw this work you did two years ago, and I kind of want to add to something like that. So it's not only a reference of something, you know, in midair, but it's also, can you recreate a work you already did? And a huge thing about is feedback as well. Um, on set, I definitely... You know, I worry about like, how does this look on camera? That is my biggest thing. And how will it look in post? Um, after additive coloring, filters, some people use CGI to either 
to add to makeup or to take away. So it definitely um, is not only just, I need makeup done and then send them out. It's definitely, you know, what, how do you want this to look after set and not only on it? Um, if you're the first AD, if you can be communicating the schedule, that way we're ready. So, you know, coming up to us and saying, hey, we should be wrapping this in 15 minutes have your team on deck to pull things out, but then also have your next set of furniture or propping ready to go. That's really huge. It helps everyone move faster. And then if you're um, on camera crew at all, not touching the set is really big. Um, I've had issues with continuity because someone comes in and moves something and then later, you know, you're in editing and you're like, that coffee mug, man. It's so frustrating. So let art be the only one that moves things. I know it seems easy for you to go in and just move something quickly, but we've taken photos, we have references, we're gonna make sure it's all in the right place. And then in the long run, it's gonna make your editor and your post work a lot easier. I probably take like two to three, yeah. It, it also depends, like if it's, you know, if we're going in to like a house, we take photos of everything beforehand so we can put stuff back. If we're in someone's home, we're gonna take a bunch of stuff out. If I'm on a stage, I would probably take every angle just to make sure I have that. I can add to that as well. Mm -hmm. um, as far as photos and being like, whether it's taking a photo of like maybe the location you might be at or um, even as far as makeup, uh, I take a photo before and after while I'm on set so that if anything happens, there's this one moment where we actually had a scene where someone had to throw cake on the face and spaghetti. So I need to know that um, I need to replicate the same thing because, you know, I can't control when certain scenes are are shot on cost sheets. Sometimes it's rearranged and things like that. So, you know, being prepared not only like, you know, in front of everything, but behind everything. Also, the biggest thing I do is um, headshot is really important to me. I actually print out people's headshots and digitally draw over and sketch like, OK, this is what I want to do. Uh, and then this is what we're planning on doing. So I have almost phases of what things can look like so that makeup is open to be progressive because it's easier to add on, but you can't take away. That is the biggest thing. Um, and then, um, you know, making sure I can take some screen, screen grabs so I know that, hey, that direction of lighting made this look brighter, darker, or you know, maybe not look so good, maybe next time when we need to redo this, my edges around it need to be flatter, um, less you know, gel blood or something. So definitely any still of any kind, whether it's pre-post or um, pre-production or post-production is extremely important. Um, and it, it helps let everyone else on set know what things will look like. Actually, I have one more thought. This doesn't always happen, but if you have a chance to go to the location, bring a tape measure, measure everything out, really understand the dimensions, because it's gonna make your job a lot easier when you're getting furniture to understand what you're working with. Um, so that's huge advice. And then if you're ordering things online furniture-wise, like take your tape measure and really mark it out so you can get a feel for it. because eventually the actors are going to interact with it hopefully and you just want to make sure does this all make sense or talk to your dp and be like hey i'm thinking a couch x y and z big does that make sense for the shot you're wanting so the more time you can spend in pre-production it's going to help you the day of the shoot do you have anything to add yeah. i was going to add one, just one more thing to as far as like preparing and things like um, a huge thing for me as for, uh, when we look on we're on site looking for a location and just like location scouting in general 
where where is my setup? You know, where is um, where am I going to work? Where is my lighting going to be? Is it going to be organic or artificial lighting? Natural lighting? Um, you know, electricity? Um, access to water is a huge thing as well. Um, and oh, I had something else on my mind as well. Oh, okay. So the biggest thing for me is probably the environment. I need to make sure that where we're shooting or if we change locations is climate going to affect makeup wear? How long is this going to wear? So, you know, it needs to match up with the quality and consistency of my products as well. Um, um, I know that there's one time on set where someone had it to jump in the water and that wasn't really discussed so much. So the environment atmosphere is extremely important, you know, um, far as mobility, how, Overexerting is is the person I'm doing makeup up needed to be, because um, then you know the more they move, the more maybe lighting. I know sometimes the commercials lighting make pe make people sweat, so I need to know ahead of time is this person kind of prone to perspiration, and I need to use more anti you know uh, sweat or like waterproof things like that. So it's ve it's very important um, to know ahead of time as far as just the feel location and the, and the look especially. Chad. Oh, it was just a funny story, but oh. sorry, Pat. <laughs> um, I don't know if you guys can speak to prop or fabrication or wardrobe or any or set design, uh, like construction. I don't know if you guys have any uh, things to say about that, but there's, there's just so much more to our department that really plays into the whole world building and everything like that. Uh, and now, I mean, would you even say the LED wall falls under our department, kind of? Because you have to build the world there, too. Yeah, you have to build the world. Um, I think you have to collaborate. I think the next step is when you're in front of an LED wall, you're collaborating with your previs department. So you're um, whoever's making the virtual world or the plate in the background to make sure you have a full understanding of what is the angle of the shot. Um, so at Cargo, we have our um, VFX person in-house as well as our DP. And on this last shoot I did, I think the three of us were together at least tw twice a week, me making sure I saw what is the plate, what's going to be projected on the background, what is the angle of that world, so I'm getting the right furniture that makes sense. I'm understanding where the camera was. We were lucky. Pronklets, you have... Um, pre-vis days and pre-lighting days. So we're measuring out how much space we have to really get a feel for where the actor is going to in interact as far as building things out. Um, so we're also lucky where we have, we call him a props master. His background is in print production, and then he's morphed into being our props person. He takes care of anything that needs to be like physically prefabricated so whether that is we had to create like a fake fence for a, um, a farm, he d planned that out and then we brought in PAs to help build that out or signage like a big printed sign or t-shirts. Um, those are all a part of art department. Any signage, Greeking, and by Greeking I mean covering up um, an exit sign or a brand. Um, so that's a big part of art department as well. Um, props, we have had to build up. We had to build out like a mad scientist thing once. So it just, it really depends on the shoot. And hopefully you have a team that can help you collaborate or you have the money to buy it. I mean, usually you don't. It's usually you just, you figure out how to build it. Um, and the thing I love about art is even though it's kind of one team that's executing day of, I would not say that it's limited to the art department. You know, you got to have the camera crew involved, the director, the writers, all involved to really make it work as you're working through pre-production. 
Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Uh, like I was saying earlier, communication, you, you've got to know what expectations are on set and if you're going to be in somebody's way or if, you know, this prop that you they want is going to fit in the area that they are wanting it in. Do you, you know, do you have to scale that down or however, um, mainly just, you know, communication <laughs> and making it happen. Like I said, you, you have to do, for me, I've had to do a lot out of nothing. Um, so, you know, it's just kind of being crafty and coming up with a way to make it happen. Do you have any comments about um, seeing any films or uh, whatnot that have not had an art department or makeup and the effects that that, that can improve your film? Does, does that question make sense? Yeah, I'm just trying to think of something. <laughs> I just see stuff all the time in films or whatever, and I'm like, well, they, they needed some help in that area, or they must have been light on that, uh, you know, with the budget on this part, or, you know, nobody thought of that, or, you know, things like that, but I can't name any specifically. <laughs> um, I would say, after getting in the industry, I watch movies differently now. I'm definitely like, oh my gosh, makeup, or like, oh my gosh, I can tell they use a silicone prosthetic and not foam. Like, it's, it's just interesting how eye for detail you naturally just like, you, you become and like you, you see. Um, it's easier, It's this might be more biased, but um, there are some films now where I see, you know what, I can tell they only made this film because maybe the mask was really good and they really wanted to use it and then everything else was kind of like, hmm. <laughs> or like, oh, I, I could tell that the director found a really good makeup artist and they hope that maybe that would save the plot or something. Um, I mean, which I can't deny, it's a huge part um, and huge thing in making anyone's vision, anyone's story come to life. Um, example would be, you know, the Goosebumps franchise, um, you know, then it became a show and then you have to bring these characters that were first words into real life people and mimicking, mimicking features on people who don't have like three goblin arms and things like that. So, um, but yeah, I see those things differently in film where I'm like, mm, makeup was really great or, or I could be like, you know what? Maybe I should have been on that film. But my favorite thing to do, though, is credits. I always wait to the end of the credits to see who the makeup artist was. Even visual effects, anything under the art department. I love to see it. Um, not only you know just getting following or getting inspired by other makeup artists, but I even follow people who did props and um, things like that. Because I'm like, wow, I definitely know they had a hand and not just props. It, it's a whole diverse thing. It's like a domino effect. Everything mm -hmm. will lead to the other, like a chapter book in school. If you don't get the, other, the last chapter, it may be difficult for the next one. So those are some things I just look out for in movies nowadays. I have one that came to mind, and it matches <laughs> the month. So Hocus Pocus 2. I don't know if maybe the younger people in here have seen mm -hmm. that. Um, in it, they have, so it's supposed to be like, they're in colonial times, Salem witch trial time. So I think that's like the 1500s maybe. No, 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 17, 1800s, sorry. Not history major. Um, and they have a witch show up and she's in a very modern outfit that does not fit the time period. And my brain is immediately like, what the heck? What was that choice? That doesn't make any sense, wardrobe department. And it just totally threw me off for the rest of the movie and put me on edge of like, what are other choices they're gonna make? Cause that was not a good choice. Or, here's another one. These are both wardrobes. I don't know if any of y'all been watching Ahsoka. No, yes, maybe. Yeah, did I say it correctly? Ahsoka, um, the new Star Wars show. So there was one outfit where she comes out and she's literally like in a jumpsuit that I could probably find at Old Navy and then a blanket over her. And I was like, wardrobe was rushed for this one. Like they did not have time. And it was only for one scene. And then the next scene she has like a typical Star Wars cloak and the pants. And I was like, man, that must have been the first day of shooting or something or someone was out sick or the outfit got ripped because that was not the plan. I think I think I usually notice wardrobe more for some reason. Um, and then continuity issues always stick out to me. 
That's a big one, but that's, yeah. Thank you guys so much for sharing with us. And giving Absolutely. Us Thank you. Thank you.